Hello and welcome to Contemplation with A Course in Miracles. Welcome to the first episode. My name is Chantel. I'm an author and I'm a student of A Course in Miracles. So I'm now going to present the original conversation, as best we know, that took place between the scribe, Helen Shuckman, and the author, which many people believe to be Jesus, the author of A Course in Miracles. And the reason I'm doing this is because I feel the introductory chapters work better or are more easier to understand when you hear them as if they're a dialogue, the dialogue between the scribe and the author. And so later on, it was put into a more academic format, especially the first few chapters. The middle and later parts of the text were naturally more lyrical, more poetic, more spiritual. But the first few chapters contained psychological language because the author was communicating with psychologists in an academic setting, and they weren't always receptive or overly receptive to spiritual language. So the earlier chapters of the text use more psychological terminology, whereas the later, the middle and later chapters of the text use more spiritual language and they're more lyrical. And so because of the academic and psychological terminology in the earlier chapters, as I was saying, it's easier to understand when it's presented as more of a dialogue. So we begin with the first line, which is in some editions, you will see miracles through your hands, through me. You will see miracles. It's a declaration, a proclamation, a statement of intent. And he says to her, it is crucial to say first that this is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. You should begin each day with the prayer, help me to perform whatever miracles you want of me today. Now, when he says perform miracles in this prayer, he doesn't mean the traditional meaning of miracles. He's not telling you that you're to ask for help in performing, for example, turning water into wine or walking on water or raising people from the dead. He's not talking about miracles in that context. In A Course in Miracles, he describes a miracle as an expression of love. And the expression of love comes from the source of love. So when you're performing a miracle as an expression of love, what you're doing is being the presence of love. You're being an instrument through which the source of love or God can be present and active through you as you go about your daily life. We'll get more into that later as we go on. So he goes on to list principles of miracles, and his first point is, the first thing to remember about miracles is that there is no order of difficulty among them. One miracle is not harder or bigger than another. They are all the same. And so that may not make sense if you're thinking about miracles in the traditional sense, but if you are thinking about miracles in the context of expressions of love, from a source of love, the ultimate source of love, then naturally one expression of love would not be bigger or more amazing than another. It would be all the same and all come from the same source. So after he says that, he lets her know, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. And he goes on to point two. Miracles do not matter. They are quite unimportant. I'll come back to that point in a second. And then point three, he says, miracles occur naturally as an expression of love. The real miracle is the love that inspires them. In this sense, everything that comes from the source of love is 
a miracle. And so this explains, again, why there is no order of difficulty among miracles, because all expressions of love are maximal. And it also explains why the thing in itself, the form in which miracles may arise, does not matter. Because the only thing that matters is the source of the miracle. And he says this source is far beyond human evaluation. And he used the term, the thing in itself meaning the form in which miracles may arise. And this is a pun. The thing in itself is a philosophy term referring to what is known as a noumenon. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You've all heard of a phenomenon. Phenomenon is sensed and perceived and experienced. But a noumenon is independent of sensory perception. It's like the invisible cause. And the phenomenon, the appearance, the manifestation, is the visible effect. So what he's saying here when he says that miracles don't matter and they're unimportant is he's saying that miracle in itself is the phenomenon and it's less important than its source, which is the noumenon. And Helen is so impressed with this turn of phrase, she thinks it's cute and she, she gets distracted from the dictation. So he says to her, you're breaking communication by thinking it's cute. This isn't wrong, but it diverts your attention. And she says, that's true. And he replies, of course it's true. And I'm really glad you get the idea. I'm not angry when this kind of thing happens, but the lesson deteriorates under lack of focus. So please read these points if they're I can't say this word, corollaries, meaning consequences or natural outcomes. Please read these three points, if they're consequences or natural outcomes, as often as you can today, because there may be a quiz this evening. And I'm going to assume that he is joking there, because there's a lot of um, dry humour within the text. And he also adds that reading these three points as often as she can during the day, is merely to introduce structure if it's needed. It's not to frighten you, he tells her. And then she says, well, would you regard this communication as a kind of miracle, maybe? And he replies, you'd better read those first three principles now. There's nothing special or surprising about this communication at all. The one thing that happened was the universal miracle which was the experience of intense love you have felt. And we have, from various sources, descriptions of certain episodes where she'd be out in public and she would feel an overwhelming sense of love and connection with the people around her, which at times embarrassed her. He says, don't get embarrassed by the idea of love. Things that are true are not embarrassing. Embarrassment is only a form of fear, and actually a particularly dangerous form because it reflects egocentricity. Don't feel guilty about the fact that you're doubting this. Just reread the first three principles, and their truth will come to you. I love you, he says, and I'm not afraid or embarrassed or doubtful. My strength will support you, so don't worry and leave the rest to me. So he is very concerned about putting her at ease because while she's all fascinated by the experience, at the same time, she's also it's also unnerving for her because this is out of her, she's an academic, and this is out of her comfort zone, basically. What she's doing there, listening to a voice, a disembodied voice, is something alien to her natural experience. But not alien to her natural experience because she appears to always have had intuitive ability, but it's alien to the idea of her self-concept, her self-image as an intellectual and an academic and a psychologist and a scientist even. He continues, do not run to Bill to tell him. There will be time, but don't disrupt things. I'll arrange the schedule. You have a lot to do today. Get dressed or you'll be late. But when you do see Bill, be sure you tell him how much he helped you through by giving you the right message. 
and don't bother with worrying about how you received it. That doesn't matter either. You were just afraid. The dictation appears to continue um, when she's riding in a cab on her way to work. They appear to be having a long discussion, and she writes in her notebook, No, it's wrong to think that maybe Dave will be healed and my husband's hernia will be cured. Now, her friend Dave had brain cancer, so she, what she was doing here was she was doubting the fact that a hernia and brain cancer could be healed in light of the previous discussion. And then the author says to her, the voice says to her, remember point one and reread now, meaning remember the first miracle principle. And this first miracle principle was, the first thing to remember about miracles is that there's no order of difficulty among them. One's not harder or bigger than another. They're all the same. Brain cancer, a hernia, nothing is impossible. Basically what the first miracle principle is saying is nothing is impossible through the power of love the power of unconditional love as expressed through you, through your hands, through your presence, but coming from an ultimate source of unconditional love. It goes on to point four. I don't know whether they're still in the cab. Perhaps they are. He says, all miracles mean life, and God is the giver of life. The giver of life will direct you very specifically. Plan ahead is good advice in this world of perception, where you should and must control and direct where you have accepted responsibility. But the universal plan is in more appropriate hands. You'll know all you need to know about the universal plan at the appropriate time, so make no attempts to plan ahead in this respect. Then he goes on to point five. Miracles are habits and should occur involuntarily. He means unconsciously. He says miracles should not be under conscious control. Consciously selected miracles are usually misguided, and in some versions he uses the term undemocratic. So let's look at this a bit closer, because this is very important. He says that miracles are habits, meaning they're a behaviour, and they should occur unconsciously, spontaneously, naturally. And he stresses later on that behaviour is always in response to what's going on in the mind. Behaviour is not independent or autonomous. It's a result of what you're thinking. And so our behaviour is naturally unconscious. We're operating under a default programme in a habitual way most of the time. Our behaviour is programmed by our thoughts. So if you put your mind, as you do with the simple prayer, help me to perform whatever miracles you ask of me today, if you put your mind at the disposal of spirit or of the giver of life and allow spirit or the giver of life to work through you as you go about your daily life and you step out of the way, you put spirit in the driving seat because the universal plan is in spirit's hands, then your behaviour will be spontaneously and organically naturally prone to creating situations where miracles happen, where miracles occur, where you have a healing presence and you're not consciously thinking about it. It's just happening as you go about your business because your mind is already at the disposal of the higher power of unconditional love, and you're just behaving naturally, and you're healing people without even knowing it, just by your presence, just by being guided as to what to say, just by a smile, an unexpected smile that you're prompted to do at a particular moment, and you may never know that you've created a healing outcome for someone by something you've said or done or not said or something you've written, or something you've expressed. You won't know because it's not conscious. But, but because you've put yourself in the hands of the universal planner, 
miracles abound. And he also says that consciously selected miracles are usually misguided. Consciously selected miracles can be a bit akin to people-pleasing or do-gooding or, or seeking approval on the one hand. And on the other hand, there may be people that you, you're guided to help or people that are going to be helped, best helped by somebody else. The universal planner, divine intelligence, arranges everything, organises everything, orchestrates everything. I think the word constellations is used later on. So you have to step out of the way and let yourself be guided. And people often ask, how do we know whether we're being guided by the spirit or whether we're being deceived by our ego, our own hidden agendas, our own unconscious agendas? How can we tell the difference whether we're being divinely guided or whether we're deceiving ourselves? And the workbook of A Course in Miracles, the mind training that it offers, helps you to discern whether you're being guided by your inner teacher or the Holy Spirit, or you're being misguided by the voice of your self-deceiver. Point six. Miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. So this again speaks to the spontaneity, the flow. You're not thinking about it. You're just being and things are happening and you may or may not know about it. Another point about miracles being consciously selected is that you could you could have difficulty saying no and you could want to help everybody and you could give yourself burnout and he goes into this later on. So it's also self-preserving to not have to think about being a good person. You're just doing it. You're not doing it to, for the sake of being good or seeking approval or people-pleasing. You are just naturally being a, a space for unconditional love, a presence of love through your behaviour, which comes from your mind, being at the disposal of spirit. So I think I'll pause here until the next episode. I think that's a lot for us to contemplate. I think we can summarise what we've contemplated today by saying that you will see miracles through your hands through me means you will be divinely guided to be in service, to be an expression of the source's infinite love to whomever you meet, to whomever you're guided to, where you can be most helpful. You don't have to worry about it. He tells us, leave the rest to me. So it's all about being divinely guided to the point, place or position where you can be most helpful to those you encounter. And I'm also reminded of a saying which says that the person you're meant to help is usually the person that you find standing right in front of you and your purpose is to deal with whatever's on your plate right now. So you don't usually have to think about it and you may find yourself being spontaneous or saying something and you don't know where it came from and it makes no sense to you, but it means all the world to the person that's receiving the message from spirit through you. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.